The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the chapter which we read at the beginning, which is the fifth chapter of the second epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, and in the 17th verse. The 17th verse in the fifth chapter of the second epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, we began the consideration of this chapter last uh, Sunday evening, and we are continuing it. But it's important that we should uh, realize why we are doing so and what is the general message of the whole chapter. The apostle, you notice, starts off with this great and resounding and assured statement. We know that if the earthly house of this tab of this our tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now there, as we were trying to see last Sunday night, is the great statement, the great offer of the Christian gospel. And uh, therefore the challenge which we all confront as we consider this message, this gospel, is just that. What is our position as we look at and contemplate the possible dissolving of the earthly house of this our tabernacle? Now, this is not, as you all will agree, uh, an artificial question. It's not an imaginary matter. It's a very real question. The state of the world tonight uh, surely compels us uh, to consider that. Now, the point I'm trying to establish is this, that this is the object of the Christian faith, to enable us to face that question. If our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. And it may be. It may be before we realize. Where are we? Do we know where we are? What have we got? What would our whole situation be? Now, that's the business of Christianity, is to bring us to face that very question. I was establishing the point that it is the only teaching that really does that. It is certainly the only teaching that has an adequate answer to that question. None of our philosophies have. None of your so-called great world religions have. They're all profoundly pessimistic, as are most of your leading philosophers at the present time. They must be, of course, because the philosophers who prophesied such a wonderful world which was to come, especially in this 20th century, have all been sadly and grievously disappointed. Everything has gone almost exactly opposite to what they'd not only expected, but to what they'd anticipated and had prophesied. But here is a solution. Here is a message that can enable one to face the end of all things and still to be more than conqueror, to be triumphant, to be able to look at it at its worst and say, We know. But even if that does happen, it's all right. It doesn't upset us. It doesn't mean that we've miscalculated. It doesn't indeed make any difference to us at all in any vital sense or manner. Now, that is the proposition of the Christian faith. And uh, that is what makes it so urgent this evening. The apostle, you notice, describes himself as an ambassador for Christ. And in Christ did he pleads with these people, be ye reconciled to God. Well, life is always urgent. Life is always serious. We never know where we are in a world like this. And things were like that in the apostles' time, but God knows they're like that at this present time. And the most urgent matter before everybody in this world this evening is just this. Are you reconciled to God or are you not? But now I say this makes this question very urgent because this is the only way to be able to face that that terrible possibility with this assurance, this confidence, this calmness, 
and this quiet. Very well. The question, therefore, that confronts us is this. How does one arrive at this? How is one to get a mastery of life, a conquest of the fear of death, the ability to look into the unknown future eternity, not only without fear and apprehension, but even at times with longing, anticipation? That's the great question. And the answer is given in this particular chapter. That's why I'm calling your attention to it. The apostle never makes a statement like this without showing how it can be brought about. Christianity is not a matter of slogans. Christianity gives us an exact description of the way of arriving at what it stands for. Now, there are cults and various other things which live on slogans. You just repeat them, and you repeat them to yourself. That's a kind of auto-suggestion, a kind of self-hypnosis. That's not Christianity at all. It's not a matter of just playing tricks with yourself. The Christian method is very different from that. It shows you exactly how to arrive at this position in which you can make this asseveration that you know that even if your earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, you have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Very well. How does one get there? Well, here's the answer in, in its essence. You can only get there in the Christian way. You can only get there by believing what the Scriptures teach. Now, this is the matter I want to deal with tonight. There are so many who go wrong at this point. There are many thoughtful people, and all intelligent people indeed at the present time, are very concerned about the whole state of the world, and about the meaning of life, what's going to happen to them, parents with young children starting to live in a world like this, they must be seriously concerned about all this and want to know what they can believe, what they can do, what they can teach their children. Life has become not only hazardous, it's unusually difficult. How can we find a way to live and to die and to do so triumphantly? That's the great question. Well, now then, there are so many, I say, who are concerned about that. But who nevertheless, the moment they confront this, begin to go wrong at the very beginning. They rather like this kind of statement. In other words, they want the benefits of Christianity, but they don't seem to be able to get them. There are many people like that. They say, I've read the lives of the saints. I wish I could live like that. I wish I could die like they died. Now, what was their secret? They want all the benefits of Christianity, but they never seem to get them. Why? Well, the answer is that they never approach them in the right way. They've never understood this point which arises at the very beginning, even in the initial approach to the gospel and its message, which tells us that if we would know and experience and feel the benefit of these Christian blessings, well, then we have got to take them in the way that they're offered. They cannot be obtained in any other way whatsoever. There are no shortcuts in Christianity. There are no shortcuts in the Christian life. We're all very keen to be after shortcuts, but you can't do that in Christianity. In other words, every blessing and every benefit that is offered in the New Testament is always something that results from the belief of and the acceptance of the faith and of the teaching. You can never get the deduction without working out the argument. You can never arrive at the result without going through the process. Now, this is something that should be obvious, but it very clearly isn't obvious. There are people who are reading the New Testaments, reading books about Christianity, reading the lives of the saints, the history of the church, and they say, but I don't seem to be able to get this. I, 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 I can't get that. That's what I want. I, I wish I were like that. That's exactly the kind of attitude I want to adopt and yet I can't get there. And why? Well, I'm saying the answer is because you will not submit to the Christian way. There is only one way. There are no modifications of it. It's got to be taken. It must be accepted as it is. And unless we do that, I say, we shall find nothing in it at all. These truths, these central principles, must be accepted first. 
Now, fortunately for us, all these principles are put before us in this one chapter. The apostle is putting it in terms of his own experience. He was a man, you remember, who had undergone a very great change himself from being a Pharisee and a persecutor of Christianity and a hater of the Lord Jesus Christ. He became one of his greatest preachers and exponents, one of the most shining, glorious saints in the whole history of the Christian church. Very well. Here's a man who's been through it. He knows exactly himself. And here he very fortunately tells us how it is we can arrive at this position. What is it? Well, we can only deal with the great general principle this evening. And here it is. That the Christian message is entirely and altogether different from everything else that is known in this world this evening. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now then, I say the principle that is taught there is this. That this Christian message, this Christian position, the Christian attitude, the position of a man who can say, yes, I know that even if I've got to die, it's all right. Even if this body is blown to nothing by the bombs, I've got a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now then, it is because he's got something that the world knows nothing about, it's entirely different, doesn't belong to its categories, is in a class quite apart, something that has never been known anywhere except here. That is the secret of his whole position. Now then, that is why I say that we've got to be clear about this at the very outset, at the very beginning. It is this first approach to Christianity that is so serious, and people won't realize that. I say they rush at the benefits, but you can't. You can't start at the end. People do that, I'm told, with novels or with detective stories. They start reading, ah, oh, they can't wait, they must go and see the answer. You can't do that with Christianity. It's impossible. Try it, you'll never succeed. You've got to go right through. There are fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. They're all here. If you don't believe them, you'll never be able to make the statement of the first verse. Now, that's the contents. That's an analysis for you of the contents of this fifth chapter of Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians. He starts with a result. How do I get there, he says. Here it is. And then he takes us through. I'm going to try to take you through to show you how to arrive at this glorious result. My dear friend, do you say, ah, but this is going to be terrible. I want to get there at once. You can't get there at once. You can only arrive at this destination of knowing after you've trodden along a given road. You've got to pass certain vital points. They're all here. This Christian doctrine, there's a synopsis of it in this very chapter. I know of nothing more urgent in this world this evening. No, oh, no, I'm not going to preach about the arrival of President Kennedy and his wife, nor about Khrushchev and his wife and all the trivialities that are still being mixed with these momentous meetings. Haven't you noticed it in your newspapers, the triviality of it all? What's it matter what shape the woman's hat is when the world is on fire? But you see, you get that on the front page, as if this were important. Christianity takes a desperately serious view of life in this world. Let these men do what they will. You and I, my friends, should be concerned about this. What's going to happen to us if they fail? What's going to happen to us if the world suddenly goes mad and these bombs are let off? That's the question for us. I thank God for this Christian message. It's the only thing that makes people serious in this mad world. Look at the things they put in juxtaposition, I say, with the world as it is this evening. There's no hope from that angle. Here's the only hope. Well, what is it? Well, I say again, it is something that they know nothing about. It's altogether different. It doesn't belong to their categories. It doesn't use their terms. The whole thinking is different. Let me demonstrate it to you. Why is this different? In what respects is it different? First, the answer is this. Here is something which doesn't change circumstances, but it changes us. Did you notice that? 
If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It isn't that the circumstances are made different. He is made different. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Ah, wait a minute, says somebody. I thought you said that things were not changed, and yet your text says that all things are passed away and that everything becomes new. Ah, here is the important question. How do things become new? What is it that enables a man to look into the face of death and say, I was once terrified of you, I'm no longer terrified. I was once alarmed and I did everything to avoid you. I'm no longer like that. I've seen beyond you. I know something that lies ahead of you. What does it? Well, you see, the answer is it doesn't change death. What does it do? Oh, it changes us. Now then, let me expound this to you. The world, you see, doesn't understand this. Because the world is always trying to change circumstances. That's its method. Here we are in trouble. What can we do? Well, how can we stop this? How can we stop them making bombs? How can we get them to succeed together in a disarmament conference? How can we get them to outlaw war? The world is always dealing with the circumstances, trying to manipulate them, trying to change them. It never succeeds, of course. It never will. Let's be perfectly clear. The times are so urgent we can't afford to mince matters at all. The Bible teaches that while the man is in sin and is an enemy against God and an alien from God, that there are going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's no question about that. And it's idle folly to talk about anything else. If you are being buoyed up this evening by the possible agreement between these two great men, well, God have mercy upon you. If you think that you are going to derive comfort from the actions of statesmen, politicians, whatever you call them, I say you are of all men most miserable and your whole position is most miserable. Oh, the world has been fooling itself and playing with this kind of thought throughout the centuries. But you see, it doesn't come. It never will come. The Bible tells us why we'll be going into this in detail some subsequent Sunday evening. But you see, it's man. It's man in sin. He's got lust in his heart. If he's got lust for another man's wife, well, then one nation will have a lust for another nation's territory. And that's why you get war, says James in chapter 4 of his epistle. But they know nothing about this. They're trying to manipulate circumstances and to change the circumstances. That isn't the biblical method at all. The biblical method is this. It doesn't change circumstances. It changes us. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Changes him. And the result of changing him is that everything appears different to him. It isn't different, but he sees it differently. Now, of course, this is a principle which uh, I can illustrate in different ways. The world doesn't recognize it about these fundamental matters, but it does recognize it in lesser matters. The world very rightly says that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That is true, isn't it? You say, oh, but beauty is something in and of itself outside there. It isn't, you know. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Two people look at the same thing. One, say, isn't that, one says, isn't that beautiful? The other says, I see nothing in it. But it's the same thing. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Not only that, we've got many other statements, haven't we, to the same effect. I always like that little couplet that puts it so perfectly. Two men looked out through prison bars. One saw mud, the other stars. Same prison, same cell, same bars, same everything. And the two men were there together in the same place, but all the difference in what they saw, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Well, now that's the kind of principle here which is taught, but lifted up, you see, and applied to these ultimate matters. Is this clear to us, my friends? It is not the business of Christianity and the preaching of the Christian message, to try to show how the world can be improved or reformed, or how our circumstances and conditions can be changed, that is not the business of Christianity at all. The business of Christianity is to enable us to face them, and face them at their worst, and to conquer them even at their very worst. I remember reading a phrase once which said something like this, it isn't life that matters, it's the courage that you bring to it. Don't think that life's going to be changed. 
This old book is enough in and of itself to prove that that doesn't happen. You read your Old Testament, come into the New, the world's always the same. Here's a book which was finished nearly 2,000 years ago, and yet as it describes life, it's describing the modern world. It's describing modern conditions. The world, the life in this world have always been difficult and trying and testing. It's always been, it always will be. Oh, what a terrible thing it would be that I should stand in this pulpit tonight and try and outline a way to change the conditions and to tell the statesmen what to do. It would lead to nothing, nothing at all. It's a sheer waste of breath and of energy. And yet people think that that's Christianity. That's the point I'm establishing. They expect the church to show the way out. The church to save people from war, to persuade the statesmen to do this and that. It isn't the business of the church to do it, and even when she tries to do it as she is trying, she never succeeds and never will. But that isn't her business. We've got a much greater task. Here it is, a greater message. To show you how you can triumph, though things go from bad to worse and end in the final cataclysm. That's the message. To change you. Not the circumstances, not the world in which you live, but so to do something to you that though things are as they are, they now to you are different. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now then, that is the proposition, the fundamental proposition. How does this happen? How does this take place? How does one undergo this great change that revolutionizes one's view and one's attitude and outlook. Well, here again, it's quite simple and quite explicit. This is something which is done to us by God and not by ourselves. I needn't emphasize that these are fundamental points, need I? See, these are preliminary considerations. If you go wrong on any one of these, you're, you'll never arrive at this destination. You'll never know how to face death and conquer it. This, I say, is something that is done to us by God and not by ourselves. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. This isn't my term, it's the apostle's term. It's a new creation, a new creature. Now, the apostle is so anxious that we shouldn't go wrong about this that he says it more than once in this very chapter. Here he says it in verse 5. Now, he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given to us the earnest of the Spirit. He says, you see, ah, this is my position in this tabernacle. We do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. He who hath wrought us, prepared us, made us for this, is God who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Oh, I can't emphasize this too much or too deeply. My dear friend, this is the essence of the Christian message. This is something that is done to us by God. It is He who makes us. We are His workmanship, as this same apostle puts it in that second chapter of his epistle to the Ephesians. Now let me put it negatively. You don't arrive at this position of being able to smile in the face of death as the result of your own efforts. Never. Of course, you can produce a kind of psychological state. You can take drugs. You can do things like that. But that's not facing it. That's avoiding it. I'm talking about really facing it. And my assertion is that you can never get there as the result of your own effort. I mean by that. Uh, a man doesn't become a Christian uh, as the result of uh, his uh, seeking and searching after the truth. That's been the great phrase, of course, of this century. We don't like this idea of revelation, of truth given to us. You see, we are so confident in our powers of uh, thinking and of investigation and of experimentation and of searching. We've done so well. We've invented microphones, electricity, we can harness the elements, split the atom, send a man up into outer space, and it's all the result of our effort and experimentation. So, of course, it's filled us with supreme self-confidence. And we say there's nothing a man cannot do, let's even investigate the problem of death. 
Let's investigate what lies beyond death. Let's examine God. We'll examine everything. But it can't be done. It is a complete and an utter impossibility. No man can ever arrive at a knowledge of God by his own efforts. No man can ever know the truth about God and salvation by his own investigation. No man by his own power of understanding, by his own ability, can ever arrive at this point. Impossible. New creation. It isn't man's work. In the same way, none of our good works, our good living, our good deeds are enough. You see, you can live a perfect life almost. You can be a paragon of all the virtues. Your moral behavior may be beyond any criticism. But it doesn't help you to face the dissolving of the earthly house of your tabernacle, does it? It doesn't answer the question. It doesn't take you far enough. It takes you to the verge of the grave. But it doesn't help you when you're there and beyond it. It doesn't know. Morality doesn't answer our ultimate questions. Morality is a good thing. I agree with you 100%. But you know, when you come to the great questions of what is man, what is life, what is death, what lies beyond, is there God? Morality doesn't help you. It leaves you where you were. No, no. This is something that is done to us by God. New creation. These are the terms. New man. New being. Regeneration. Being born again. These are the things that make a man a Christian, according to the New Testament. And nothing less than that. And yet we persistently go on trying to make ourselves Christians, don't we? We try to discover the answers and the solutions, but we never succeed, and yet we go on trying. We beat our heads against that brick wall, and we'll go on doing it. We are battered, and we are bleeding, and we are blind, and we are helpless, but still we won't give up, and we won't give in. But until you do, my friend, you'll never know this position. You'll never know this mastery of life, this conquest of death, this final confidence, this assured optimism. We know it's done by God's is the apostle. And so, you see, he brings in the whole notion of the creation and of God as the creator. This is something that is done to us by God. And I do thank God for this. Because, you know, if this were not the case, it would be a very poor gospel, this. But because it is God, there is hope for everybody. That is why this same apostle, in writing to the Romans, said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Well, because it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And he'd previously said this to them. He said, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Now, you know, there's nothing else in the world tonight that can make that statement. You take these great philosophers and their philosophy. Can you follow them? Can you understand them? I don't know the figures. How many people listen to the third program? I gather from the statistics that when they do put on their brain trust, they put it on late at night because the majority of people are not interested. They say, we can't follow it. What are these men talking about? Quite right. There's no gospel there. There's no answer there. There's no solution there. But that's the characteristic of all the world's methods and ways. It postulates ability in me. It postulates understanding. I must have a brain. I must be able to follow the terms and go on with the process. And I go on from step to step. But I say, Tom, Dick, and Harry, they can't do it. There are people who haven't got brains by nature. They haven't had much education. And they wouldn't take what little was given to them. Well, is there any hope for them? Well, I say, thank God there is. It is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believes it. I'm in a mess. The world is in a mess. Uh, don't come and tell me to pull myself together and reorientate myself and remake myself and remake my world. I can't do it. Nobody can. But when I'm told, as the gospel tells me, that he who created everything out of nothing at the beginning is concerned about me. That he has the power to make me anew. Well, there's hope for me. But that's the gospel. I don't do it. I can't change myself. But God, who made me at the beginning, can make me anew. This is a gospel of God's activity 
the regeneration, the new beginning. Very well, that brings me to my next point, which is this. That this uh, change, you see, which changes me and makes me see everything differently, is, I say, something that is done to me by God, and it's something, therefore, which is very radical and very great and very profound. It is indeed nothing less than a creation. That's the term that the apostle will persist in using. Now, let me again emphasize this, because there are so many who go wrong. They think that to be a Christian means that your life is modified a little bit. Oh, there you were, you were a non-Christian. How do you become a Christian? Well, you drink less, you smoke less, you do a little less of this and that, and on the other hand, you take up good works, and you start going to church, and you begin to read your Bible, and you do this, that, and the other. They're always thinking in terms of modification or in terms of little additions to life. Oh, what a travesty of Christianity that is. Christianity is not an addition to life. It's a revolution in the life. It's the ending of something and the beginning of something new. It is, to use the very term in our text tonight, a new creation. You see, the apostle here is astonished at the whole thing. That's what he's trying to bring out. He's amazed even at himself because of the profound and the radical character of this th change that has taken place in him. He says, you know, as a Christian, my whole life in its totality is different from what it was before. I'm a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The greatest tragedy in the world tonight are the is to be found, I think, in the small, inadequate, incomplete views that people hold of the Christian faith, the Christian message, and what it means to be a Christian. Don't misunderstand me when I put it like this. The Christian is not only a good man. He is a good man. But he's something much more than that. He's a new man. Entirely new. There is something there that wasn't there before. There's a new beginning. He's a new creature. He's got a new nature inside him. It isn't an improvement of the old. It isn't a modification. It isn't an addition to. It is a new nature. There is a principle in him of life and of power and of understanding that wasn't there before. He is a new man. Now, I do think this is the most glorious aspect of the Christian faith. And yet how it's missed and how it's forgotten. There is a type of so-called Christianity which is not Christianity at all. It's like putting on a cloak. It's something people put on on Sunday, then take it off and forget about it till next Sunday. That's not Christianity. Christianity is something that's at the center of a man, if it's there at all. Our Lord put it, you remember, perfectly to the woman of Samaria when he said, you know, he said, I'll use an illustration. You come here to draw water out of that well. All right, he said, you come and you draw water. You go home, you use it, you come back again. He that drinketh of this water shall thirst again. He'll have to keep on coming back and drawing out of the well. But he that drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him as a well of water springing up into everlasting life. That's the difference. You don't put it on, it's in you. It's bubbling up within you. It's a principle of life in you. It's a new creation. The God who made everything at the beginning has made the man anew. He's a new man altogether. Now that was the thing, of course, that was so striking, as I've reminded you in the experience of this mighty man, this Apostle Paul. Contrast for a moment Saul of Tarsus, the blaspheming, persecuting Pharisee that hated Christ, and the gospel preacher, the apostle Paul, as we know him in these epistles and as we read about him in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. There's only one thing to say. They're two different men. And that's why the apostle himself, in writing to the Galatians, says, I live yet not I. You remember it, don't you? Galatians 2 at the end. I live yet not I. Well, what is it? Oh, Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. My friend, have you been trying to make yourself a Christian? Have you been saying, oh, I wish I could say, I know that if 
Well, the earthly house of this, my tabernacle, we're dissolved. I've got a building. I wish I'd give anything to get. I'm going to try to get there. You'll never get there. You've got to be made anew. You've got to be born again. The hands of the almighty creator, which made you at the beginning, have got to make you again. He'll smash you. He'll remold you. He'll refashion you. He'll make you according to the image of his dear son. That's the teaching. It is a man receiving a new faculty which governs and controls everything from the very heart and center of his life. It is nothing less than that. Tell me what was your idea of a Christian. Was it to be brought up in a Christian home? Was it to do this, that, or the other, and to refrain from other things? Is that it? Oh, God deliver you from it. That's the snare of the devil. That's the artifact of the evil one. That's the counterfeit of the enemy of your soul. No, no. A Christian is made by God, not by man. In any shape or form. Preachers don't make Christians. They can get decisions. They can persuade people to join their church. That doesn't make a man a Christian. You see, the cults can do that equally well. That's not it. This is to be a Christian. That the Holy Spirit of God has taken hold of you and has made something new in you. Has put a principle, a faculty of life that simply wasn't there before. And you're a new man in a new universe. That's Christianity. It is the profoundest, the greatest the deepest, the mightiest change that can ever take place in the whole universe. That's Christianity. New creature, new creation, nothing less than that. Well then, what does it lead to? This is the point, isn't it? God having done this to us, God having put this new principle of life into us, this new faculty, what results? Well, all I want to note this evening is this. That it makes a man think in a new way. You notice how the apostle has put it? This is how he puts it here. Wherefore he says, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him so no more. He says, I've undergone a very great change. He says, I uh, used to know men. I used to look at men, and I had my theories about men, and I used to say what I thought about men. But you know, he said, I I, I don't think like that about men any longer. We know men after the flesh. That's how it used to be. But I don't look at men after the flesh now, says the apostle. I don't think in the same way. This is the astounding thing about becoming a Christian. Your whole thinking is revolutionized. You don't even think in the same way. Before you thought after the flesh. That's how the world thinks tonight. The world always thinks after the flesh. That's to say, with its own powers, its own ability, its own understanding and its own knowledge. So, you see, it thinks in terms of its curtains. One side of the curtain, other side of the curtain. Christians don't think like that. Christianity is not anti-communism. There are people who are trying to say that it is. And there are many who are ready to join with the Roman Catholic Church because it says that, but that's not the biblical teaching. Christianity doesn't divide up mankind into communists and anti-communists. It defines everybody in their relationship to God. And it knows that there are as many sinners on this side of the Iron Curtain as there are on the other. That's thinking after the flesh. But I don't do that any longer, says Paul. My whole thinking is utterly and absolutely revolutionized. I want that communist to be saved as much as I want the greatest anti-communist to be saved. We are not interested in political labels here. We are interested in souls, in human beings, in men and women who are going to die, whose tabernacles may suddenly be dissolved, And they stand before God in the judgment. That's what we're interested in. That's how we think of everything now. It's a new way of thinking. You see, because a man has got this new life and this new principle of life, he sees everything from a new point of view. He is not standing where he was before. His whole position has been changed. He doesn't have the same points of reference any longer. 
The Christian, as I say, is only one point of reference. It's God. Everything is brought to the light of God. The world doesn't do that at all. The world thinks after the flesh. In terms of man, life in this world, how long is it going to last? Manipulating this and that, making arrangements and pacts and, compr and compromises. That's the fleshly, carnal, worldly way after the flesh. I don't think like that any longer, says Paul. You know, it must have taken him a great deal of time to understand even himself. I believe that's why he went for those three years into Arabia. This revolution had come in. Everything was different. He's got to work it all out. And he did work it out. And you and I are asked to do the same thing. As a Christian, we have different tests, different standards, different everything. Is this clear, my friends? The church is not a department of the state. No, no, she's different. She's altogether separate. She's unique. These do not belong together. That belongs to Caesar. That belongs to the flesh. It's all under God eventually, I know. But this is unique. This is separate. This is spiritual. This is spiritual thinking. And we must keep these things distinctly apart. Otherwise, we shall land ourselves in nothing but confusion, and we shall miss the benefits and the blessings and the consolations of this glorious gospel. Very well, here it is. This is the first result. I leave it at this this evening. Henceforth, no we no men after the flesh. Tell me, how do you think? That's the question. That's the test. How do you think? How do you think about life? Oh, you say, well, I want to have a competence. I want to have a certain amount of comfort. I want to bring up my children, all right. Do you stop there? Or do you go on? Ah, oh, you say, I know that a time has come, of course, when I've got to go, I leave this world. The earthly house of my tabernacle will be dissolved. It's already decaying. I'm getting older. I haven't much time here. Do you go on to that? If you don't, you know, you are thinking after the flesh. Oh, you want to do well, you say. I want to leave a great name behind me. All right, that's thinking after the flesh. What proves at once that you've started thinking after the spirit, which is the opposite, is that you're concerned about your soul, the imperishable part of you. That you raise this question of death and that you're not satisfied until you've got the answer. Now that's a change in thinking. Have we started thinking in any way except after the flesh, my dear friends? With the world as it is tonight, surely the time has come when you stop thinking after the flesh. That will only lead to the dissolution, to the end. There's nothing there, there's no hope, you'll never find it. The world cannot produce it because the world is under condemnation. It's a doomed world. And the one thing to discover is Oh, how to live in such a way, how to die in such a way, that I have no fear, but that I know where I am and where I'm going. Now, that's a different style of thinking. And that's precisely the first result of this, of undergoing this great change, which is called a new creation, a new creature, regeneration, being born again, being given a new life, becoming a new man, Oh, that's it, I say. It isn't that you arrive at something. No, no, it's given to you. It's God doing it. And then having put this new life, you think in this new way. And the result is, as I say, you see everything differently. God becomes different. Man becomes different. The Lord Jesus Christ becomes different. It's all in this chapter. Life becomes different. Death becomes different. What lies beyond death becomes different. Everything is different. A poet once attempting to say this, a Christian poet put it like this. He says, the heaven above is softer blue, earth around is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue, Christless eyes have never seen. The moment a man becomes a Christian, everything's different. A new softness in the heavens, a new greenness in the grass. Every tint and every color is the mark of the Creator. Oh, I think I've told you before. 
of the two men who went on holiday to the country and stood at a gate looking at a field of ripened wheat. And the one said, what a fine crop. And the other said, well done, God. That's it. Oh, the man who's got a Christian nature, a new nature, he not only thinks in a different way, because of that he sees everything differently. He sees his God, his Lord, his Christ, everywhere. He's in the same world, but he doesn't see it as he saw it. He saw a public house of old and he wanted to go in. There was the pleasure and the joy and the happiness. He sees it as the thing that was tending to ruin him now. Same public house. And all the world's gaudy attractions and enticements, he sees them, yes, but they're not the same. Nothing is the same. Everything is new. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There, my friend, is the beginning of the answer to the question I posed at the beginning. How can I get into the position in which I can say, I know, I am certain, I am absolutely sure that though the earthly house of this my tabernacle were dissolved, I have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What's the answer? Ah, you need an entirely new outlook. You need to be changed completely by the power of God. You need to become a new creature, a new man. You need a new outlook altogether. You've got to cease to be one thing. You start to be another. And you can't do it yourself. But it is something that is offered to everybody who seeks it and who desires it. If any man be in Christ, that's the answer. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's Christ that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have this everlasting life. That's it, this new principle, this life eternal. It's all as a free gift of God in Christ. And all you have to do is to realize you haven't got it. And to see your bankruptcy, your emptiness, your lost estate, your woe, and your utter bankruptcy as you face the end. And ask God humbly to have pity and to have compassion upon you and to touch you with his almighty power and to work this miracle in you and give you life and you breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life and you, that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. That's all. Helplessness, hopelessness, despair, and crying out unto him. He will work this miracle divine in you. And then, you see, you'll begin to look at these things differently. You'll see Christ to be your everything, your Savior, the one who has made sin for you, the one whom God punished in your stead that you might be forgiven freely and might be given his righteousness. Oh, thank God, that in the world as it is tonight, with all the despair and the heartache, and the hopelessness and the confusion. Thank God in this bewildering world where everything is failing and man excelling and exceeding himself in his powers of discovery in one respect but failing so lamentably in the other. Thank God in such a world that it is possible for us to be made anew by God and be enabled to think in such a way that nothing is the same to us, that the sting has been taken even out of death, that we can smile at the grave, that we can challenge them saying, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. Have you got it? Can you face death and the grave like that? Can you triumph over it? Do you know that your eternal future is safe? Let the world do its worst. Let hell be let loose. It can never rob you. 
of this inheritance which God is preparing for you. There's only one way to arrive at that. It is to realize your need of being born again, of receiving a new nature, of being made by God, a child of God, and a new creature. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.